joining me today. So thank you very much for joining. I hope that you'll uh, get a lot out of this uh, presentation today uh, because I'm going to be talking about developing and also evaluating secure open source software. So very quickly, here's my outline. I'm just going to jump right into it. So quick, quick background because I found that some people don't know about some of these things. Uh, first of all, I'm talking about open source software. What is open source software? Well, that's software licensed to users with certain freedoms. Run it uh, for any purpose, modify, study, freely redistribute either the original or a modified version. Uh, there's a full definition in the open source definition, and there's a lot of common licenses like the MIT, Apache 2.0, uh, LGPL, GPL. Um, if you're talking about software and it's not open source software, typically it's called closed source or proprietary software. Um, although it's not as focused, it's not the focus of this talk, it's important to understand that open source software, at least under US law, is a kind of commercial software. It's licensed to the general public and automatically that makes it commercial software. That makes, that's actually pretty important if you ever have to interact with some organizations like the uh, US government. Um, open source software licenses uh, enable worldwide collaborative development of software and that can have many positive benefits including uh, positive benefits for so for security open source software is critically important today here's some figures you know almost all 98 percent of code bases uh contain open source software uh, when Synopsys looked into programs, they found that even if the software as a whole was proprietary, when you average things out, 70% of code bases were internally open source, and there's more and more and more open source components uh, within applications, and that growth continues. Now, so I've talked about open source software. Now let me talk about security. The reality today is that all software is under attack. Open source, closed source, doesn't matter. They're all under attack. And here's just some of the many, many examples uh, that I hope, I hope I don't have to strongly prove this uh, in this context, but just, you know, it's not just open source. It's not just closed source. It's all software is under attack, both directly attackers trying to exploit these vulnerabilities and via supply chain attacks where attackers try to subvert the process of getting the software to the, its eventual users. If you only can look at one slide today, Here's your slide. Now, I'm kind of hoping you'll see some other material I'm going to talk about. But if you are developing open source software, I'm hoping that you understand you need to make it secure as one of those important categories. Well, how do I do that? Well, here's kind of a top list of things that you need to be doing. Number one, and in many ways the most important, learn how to do it. The sad state of affairs today is that most colleges, most universities that teach how to develop software um, don't teach how to develop secure software. I think that's terrible. I think that's awful, but it is a reality. Um, so if you don't already know how to do it, take a course, learn. Um, if you don't have that already easily available, um, please consider taking this Secure Software Development Fundamentals. It's a free course. There's a URL right there. I'll show it again later. It's on edX. Um, it costs you exactly zero dollars. Costs you nothing, and it will help you understand how to develop. I'll go over some basics of that, but really, take a course. It won't take long. And of course, it's more than learning. You apply what you learn, right? So make the secure that you develop secure by default, make it easy to use securely, harden it against attacks, uh, make it so that well, when the re user receives it, it's ready to go secure and to run securely. Number two, if you're developing open source software, work to earn a best CII best practices badge. There's another URL. I'll talk more about these in a moment. Um, but basically, it's a list of criteria that if you do are going to more to increase the likelihood of producing secure software. Number three, use a lot of tools to find vulnerabilities in your continuous integration pipeline. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of tools available. I've listed some common ones here, you know, quality scanners, AKA linters, uh, there's security code scanners, there's secret scanning, there's uh, software component analysis, there's web application scanners, there are fuzzers. Um, you wanna use multiple, cool, multiple different kinds of tools, you wanna use multiple tools. 
tools just by themselves aren't enough to make software secure. Uh, you still have to know how to make secure software in particular, but they can be an important part of that of making secure software. Uh, next, monitor for known vulnerabilities and what you depend on. Nowadays, most software brings in a lot of other software. If those dependencies have vulnerabilities, then that may become a vulnerability in the system that you've created using them. So you need to monitor them and update when they're vulnerable, which means, number five, you need to enable rapid update of your dependencies. You know, and once you find out that there's a known vulnerability, you need to be able to quickly update, quickly ship. Um, how do you do that? Well, package managers and automated tests are keys to that. Um, because package managers automate the process of managing your dependencies, and there's different kinds, but you need to use them. And your tests, your automated tests should include native tests, a test to make sure that things that shouldn't work stay not working, and be thorough enough to, you know, to ship if it passes. Some people ask you, well, how much do I need to test? And the answer is, um, you make enough of an automated test suite so that if it passes your test suite, it's ready to ship. If it's not there yet, then your automated test suite's not good enough yet. Number six, evaluate before selecting dependencies. Um, I guess in some sense that's out of order, but you basically, before you bring in a dependency, make sure, you know, evaluate it, make sure you're bringing in the one you think you're bringing in. Make it easy for your users to update. Things like providing stable APIs so that they can quickly update when there's a problem. And finally, number eight, continuously update. Attacks get better, so attack, so defenders also need to get better. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that um, you know perfection is the one and only goal here. Uh, vulnerabilities are risks. It's hard to eliminate all risks, but you can manage risks. You can mitigate them. You can reduce the likelihood. You can reduce their impacts. Um, but you have to actually think about doing that. David, there is one question in the question sure. Q and A. If you want to. Um, yeah, we. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go. We probably need to. Uh, we. It might be wise to have not too many because we're. We after I'm done with my presentation, I'm hoping to have an open. Uh, uh, you know, uh, an open uh, set of questions. But yeah, let's. Uh, please do. I want to answer questions. Uh, oh, I need to click on things. Let's see. Where do I click? On? Uh, Q and A. All right. Uh, if I'm trying to select them to add an application, how would the badges help me? Um, let's see here. Uh, basically, the badges will give you an idea of whether or not those projects are working to develop secure software and you know where they stand. So um, trying to achieve the best practices for your own project helps your project get secure. Looking for projects that have achieved those badges or at least are well on the way to achieving them uh, gives you confidence that the projects you're bringing in that you're de as your dependencies are in fact more likely to be secure. All right, so let me talk a little bit about some of the things that I um, I gave in my summary slide. I talked about this course about developing uh, about secure software development fundamentals. It's a set of, th of three free courses. It's not a huge time commitment. You've got approximate hours here. I mean, if you took an hour a day, you'd be done in less than two weeks. Um, and it covers these topics. Um, you know, how to design, what are the design principles for security, things like least privilege is and least privilege, how to apply those, uh, how to examine designs, how to use accept lists and not delight lists to constrain untrusted inputs. If you're taking inputs from someone you can't trust, you should be very, very strict on what you accept, L define very strict patterns on these are the only input values allowed and just reject everything else. This is incredibly effective, effective on limiting a lot of attacks. Know the most common kinds of vulnerabilities. You know, there's various top 10 and top 25 lists, and then how to prevent each one. Uh, use hardening methods so that, yes, you're probably going to have some bugs in your code, but not all bugs are equal. You can take a lot of steps to reduce the likelihood that a bug is a vulnerability. Uh, I already mentioned adding a lot of vulnerability detection tools to your CI pipeline. It talks in more detail what the different kinds of common tools are, their pluses, their, their strengths, their weaknesses, how to apply them. Um, and of course, uh, and this course, unlike many, has materials uh, specific to using and developing open source software. Uh, we got some, somebody needs to put mute on. All right. 
Um, one nice thing about this little this course is not only is it free, but it has a, a large number of small modules and almost all of them have a little quiz at the end. Uh, this is a very simple technique, but I found that it's really, really helpful to stay on track instead of just you know, blindly reading, oh wait, I got a little quiz, I got to answer my quiz and that really helps. You can pay to try to earn a certificate, you don't have to, but uh, some people want to be able to prove that they learn the material and so we offer that as well. Um, by the way, this is a project within the Open Source Security uh, Foundation's Best Practices Working Group. All right, let me talk a little bit about some of those key points that are covered in much more detail in that course or other courses about developing secure software. So uh, I've heard some people say that, hey, my software doesn't have a design. Well, your software might not have a documented design, but if it runs, it has a design because a design is simply how you divide your problem into components and how they interact. That's all, all it's meant by design. Working software always has a design. Um, but some designs are way better than others in terms of being secure. So there are some things called design principles, which are basically rules of thumb to help you avoid common serious design flaws. And there's a number of time-tested design principles, things like least privilege. Give your software the least privilege it can to work because that greatly reduces the impacts if there's a security problem of some kind. Another one is complete mediation, also known as non-bypassability. In other words, if there's some check that's important for security, make sure an attacker can't bypass it. It's remarkable how many client-side JavaScript programs and mobile applications fail this because they insert security checks uh, in code that's going to be running on a computer you can't trust. Uh, this happens over and over again. And by the way, the problem with things like least failing to know about or apply least privilege or non-bypassability is that it's often a lot of work to change your code later to fix the problem. Whereas if you knew about them ahead of time and applied them, it's no big deal. I've often heard that security can be ex expensive. Well, it's it's not usually very expensive if you think about it ahead of time. But if you have to rejigger all your code, um, Trying to retrofit security is typically what's expensive, not security. But retrofitting security, oh yeah, that can be very expensive. I mentioned earlier, you need to know the most common kinds of vulnerabilities and how to avoid them. Uh, depending on how you measure, over 90% or maybe even 99% of vulnerabilities fit into a relatively small set of categories. So if you know about those categories and know how to prevent each one and, and do that, you can re reduce your vulnerabilities by at least an order of magnitude. Um, there are some widely used, carefully crafted lists of common vulnerabilities. You should know them, you should use them. If you're using web applications, a lot of folks use the OWASP top 10 for web applications. Uh, if you're doing anything else, a commonly used list is the CWE top 25 list. Um, top 20, the 25 is actually a little bit of misleading because they do list 25, but they also list some extras on the cusp, which are a couple extra that aren't the top 25, but maybe you should think about those too. The good thing is once you know about these common kinds of vulnerabilities and how to avoid them, you squash an incredible number of vulnerabilities in your software. So here's some examples, things like Injection vulnerability, something, uh, there's a common problem that can be a disaster, in particular for web applications, uh, called SQL injection. Um, and these are incredibly easy to counter. If instead of concatenating strings, you use something called prepared statements, then um, uh, the code is easier to see, it's sometimes faster, um, it's easier to understand, and it'll counter SQL injection attacks. Another common problem is cross-site scripting. Another problem is buffer overflows, which is actually a subset of a larger category called memory safety failures. Uh, these are still endemic. 70% uh, of the Chrome vulnerabilities and of Microsoft's vulnerabilities um, are memory safety failures and have been for many, many years. Um, so once you know about these, you can start countering them and eliminating them as a problem for your software as vulnerabilities. Now, I mentioned earlier, you need to do more than uh, just know in your head you need to apply, but you know what, it's hard to be perfect. So it's important to also add vulnerability detection tools to your CI pipeline. And the key here is to detect problems early, okay? 
Now there's many, many different kinds of tools. You should include multiple kinds, and in many cases include multiples even of the same kind. You can think of tools as a kind of automated reviewer. Uh, different reviewers, human reviewers will notice different problems, different tools notice different problems. And so you really wanna bring a suite to them, uh, to, uh, to, to bear. Practically all tools have both false positives and false negatives. They're almost always going to have at least one and typically both. Um, false positive means that it's going to report something that isn't really a vulnerability. False negative means it's not going to report something and it was a, it was a vulnerability. Uh, what does this mean? You still need to think. Um, the false positive means just because a tool reports something, it doesn't mean that's an actual problem. You need to figure out what to do about it. Maybe you don't need to change your code. Maybe you just need to tell the tool that, no, that's not really a vulnerability. Or maybe you need to change how you do this, develop your software so that that false positive is no longer triggered. Um, false negatives are a problem, of course, because the tools aren't going to find everything, which means you still need to know how to develop secure software. You still need to apply those design principles. Um, again, try to have many tools. Now, there is a really different kind of strategy you'll need to apply depending on whether or not you're doing a greenfield project or a brownfield project. By greenfield, I mean it's a new start. There's no code. Brownfield, oh, man, here it is. Congratulations. It's a million lines of code. It may have been around for years. Okay. If it's greenfield, a new start. Typically, you want to add uh, the tools right now, probably as many as you can, as many as you, as you can, get them into your C CI pipeline, make them really sensitive. Why? Because the instant you start writing code at all, it'll immediately warn you about problems and constructs that are dangerous. And you can, oh, I guess I see, I see that. Do this instead. And then all the rest of the code will uh, apply that those lessons. Brownfield's very, very different. Okay. If it's an existing project, you typically need to add tools very slowly and start by um, greatly reducing their sensitivity, really limit what they report, and then slowly increase their sensitivity over time. The problem here is that if you just add a whole bunch of tools and make them sensitive, you'll be completely overwhelmed with reports. Oh, look, there's a billion reports. Um, I can't possibly handle that. Right. Okay. Start with most with a very few tools, start with most important limit, and then add things over time. Uh, there was a question earlier about the CI best practices badge. Let me talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the CI best practices badge is uh, essentially a list of criteria of, a bunch of best practices for open source projects. And the goal of those criteria is to better improve quality and security. So here's an example of some of these criteria. You know, the project sites must support HTTPS. They must use at least one automated test suite. At least one static code analysis tool must be applied. Uh, that's a, a tool that analyzes the code without running it. And the project must publish the process for reporting vulnerabilities because, you know, even after you do everything, there may still be a vulnerability. Make it as easy as possible for people to report it back to you. And these are based on the practices of well-run open source software projects. If an open source software project meets those criteria, it earns a badge. Uh, and this enables projects and potential users to know its status. So there's that question earlier about, you know, uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a potential user, how, what do these do for me? Well, they help you figure out, oh, wait a minute, this project is working hard to apply a lot of good practices. Uh, there are three, actually three badge levels, passing silver and gold, but I'll note that even getting a passing badge is uh, a significant achievement. Um, participation's widespread. Um, uh, I have on the slide deck is 3,700. It's actually over 3,900. We're getting really close to 4,000 participating projects. There's over 500 um, passing projects. Uh, and you can see the current statistics right there on that URL. And this is also a project within the OpenSSF Best Practices Working Group. Now, if you are a user of open source software, okay, another, including, by the way, a developer software that's using other open software as a dependency. And by the way, that includes most software developers. So what do you do? Well, number one, is there evidence that developers work to make it secure? And oh, by the way, all those things I just told you before about how should developers develop secure software, now your job is to look to see if they're doing that. 
Okay, you know, are they doing things like applying the CI best practices match? Um, number two, is it easy to use securely? Three, is it maintained? You wanna look for things like recent commits, multiple developers. Does it have significant use? Now, you have to be careful here. There is a real problem in the software development world with uh, what I call fad engineering. You know, oh, big company X uses it, therefore that must be the right software for me. No, actually they probably have very, very different problems than you do. Um, so, you know, just because somebody else uses it does not mean it's an appropriate software, it's appropriate software for your circumstance. However, there is something to it. If there are no users, there's probably going to be no reviewers. It's probably not going to be maintained well in the future. So, you know, it should have some use. Um, what's the software license? Uh, we still have people today who have the misguided thought that if there's no license on the software, um, it's open source or it's usable by anybody. Uh, the law around the world has not changed because some people think that, okay? The law is the law. And if you, if you want to be allowed to use the software, it has to be licensed. This isn't some ideal. This is what, law, what laws around the world say. Um, so what do you, and there are various tools that can help you identify the components within them to figure out things like the license and also uh, if there's known vulnerabilities in them. If it's important, what is your own evaluation? Okay, and the great thing about open source software is it makes it possible. Um, I, I like to note to, folk, to folks that citizenship isn't trustworthiness. If you want to trust something, look at the code. And did you acquire it securely? And the bigger problem there, biggest problem there is, did you acquire the right thing? Now, I mentioned evaluation. If the software is important to you, not examining it is a risk. If you just take some bits, whether it's open source or proprietary, that's a risk, okay? Um, so it's, I think it's often a good idea to review the software because even a brief review of the code can give us some insight. You know, again, is there evidence that developers are trying to develop secure software? Um, you can often find some evidence of insecure, woefully incomplete software. Um, you know, are, you may run some tools against it. You can look for evidence of maliciousness. Um, and of course, you know, trying to figure out the likelihood that the packages were developed, were generated from the source code it claims. And there are folks who can do that for you for a fee if you don't want to do it. Now, when you're downloading some software, there are some things to think about. And there are some complicated things. Before you go complicated, there's some simple things you can do that can lower risks with almost no cost. First of all, double check the name. Make sure you have exactly the correct name before you add a package as your dependency or download it for use. Uh, today, the most common kind of malicious attack in, uh, on open source software is typo squatting, creating projects that have similar names but not exactly the correct names. Um, why? Because attackers can take the easy road and this is easy. Instead of trying to subvert the software, just make another project. Uh, check for dashes versus underscores, ones versus Ls, Unicode characters, and also check its popularity, things like, you know, uh, when was it released, what's the download counts, and so on. Um, if, if you are try, about to use a package you know has been around for 10 years and is widely used, and oh look, here's this package, it was created last month, it's got three downloads. That's not it, right? You don't need to be a genius to realize that's not the what you were looking for. So, you know, some simple checks can actually avoid a lot of problems. Um, and of course, download and install in a trustworthy way, you know, whatever its usual redistribution approach, try to use HTTPS instead of HTTP. Um, uh, one technique that is, is, is actually really helpful is download and delay. Download, but don't install it quite yet uh, particularly if you're doing application level packages, uh, because sometimes if a system, if a site, if a download site gets attacked, it's noticed, it gets fixed. But if you waited a little bit, then um, you didn't end up in, installing the maliciously, the maliciously subverted one. Uh, try to verify it's digitally signed, but the challenge there is that there are challenges today with digital signature and verification. I'll talk more about some efforts to try to deal with that later. Now, of course, when you're operating the software, you know, protect, detect, respond. Uh, you need to protect, protection's great, but, you know, 
things happen, so you also need to detect and respond to attacks, constantly monitor, and if a vulnerability is found in a dependency, examine it quickly. Uh, if you know it can't be exploited in your environment, fine, but otherwise you want to rapidly update, test, ship, as I mentioned earlier. And the key here is you've got to be faster than your attackers. If you're waiting a month, that's probably pointless because the attackers aren't waiting a month. As soon as the vulnerabilities become known, the clock is ticking. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I should just note that uh, although attackers certainly attack vulnerabilities in the software itself, attackers also attack the process where, uh, where software uh, emerges from developers' heads all the way out to eventually being used. I mean, so there is a process that, uh, that is used to develop software. Typically, developers create a local environment. It gets merged into some data uh, source and data repository, uh, build, verify, approve, released as some sort of distribution platform, and then either selected directly by users or selected and brought into larger systems, which build and build and build. And of course, attackers can attack all those steps. But the, okay. but the good news is that there are many ways to counter those once you realize, oh wait, attackers will try to attack me, but I don't just have to accept that. I can actively work to counter them. Things like using two-factor authentication for my repository so that um, arbitrary people can't just guess a password and break in and take over control over my software. There is no silver bullet, okay? Um, now, uh, so you really need to think about a number of different things. Now, what's coming in the future? Um, the, my crystal ball is a little fuzzy, um, but uh, my here are my best guesses. Um, I think we're going to see more help in evaluating open source software. I'll note that OpenSSF is working on providing a data dashboard, uh, metricsopensf.org. Chaos is working to define more metrics. There, there's a lot of folks working on trying to make it easier to evaluate open source software so that at least you know, hey, there's three different open source software packages. Which one should I use? You can have better information. Next up, um, wider use adoption and requiring software bill materials. Um, a little earlier this year, the US White House released something called the Executive Order on Cybersecurity. Um, it includes a number of things, including a number of requirements and statements about so software bill materials. Um, today, generally, when users get some software, they have no idea what's inside them, okay? And it looks a whole lot like the world of medicine looked like in the early 1900s, late 1800s, um, where, you know, people would hand you medicine and Lord only knows what's in there, uh, you know, might be uh, some, some illicit drugs or things that you might not have otherwise wanted to put in your body. Um, and yet, for software, we have no idea what's inside there. Um, there are all package managers can already track within within single ecosystems of uh, the software within a system, but there are standards now in in development uh, or released that uh, let you share software bill materials. In other words, the ingredients of a larger piece of software. Um, I'll note that SPDX exists today. It's uh, it's now um, at the PRF level in ISO. Um, uh, and there's some other work as well. So, so basically, there's already work ongoing to enable sharing the software bill of materials, and I expect to see more of that in the days ahead. Um, I think package managers and repositories are going to improve their countermeasures. Um, there's something called re verified reproducible builds, which lets you verify that the uh, bits that you're about to install really did come from the source code that was evaluated by developers. Um, the lack of this was, for example, uh, a problem for the recent SolarWinds debacle with Orion, where the code that was being installed and run was actually not generated strictly from the source code that was developed by the developers. You know, the developers developed code and they reviewed it, but that's not what was used to sh be shipped to use, uh, developers because someone subverted uh, the uh, developer, development process, the build process, actually. Um, Cryptographic signature verification. Uh, from a mathematical point of view, cryptographic signatures are solved. We know how to do it, math-wise. 
But there's a lot more to the world than mathematics. Uh, applying sig cryptographic signature verification in the real world has turned out to be a challenging problem. And so uh, one, one Linux Foundation project is called SigStore, which is working hard to make uh, cryptographic signature verification much easier, also working on improving uh, get signing abilities. Um, integrity attestation, there are things like Intoto and Alvarium to help with uh, attestation of integrity. Increased use of memory safe and safe languages. Um, if performance is not super important, there's a huge number of programming languages that um, are available that are also memory safe. But when you really need a uh, strong, uh, very good performance, uh, a lot of programs today are written in C and C++, which are not memory safe. And this has led to 70% of the vulnerabilities today in a lot of systems are memory safety problems. So increased use of languages that just prevent this whole cloth uh, I think is uh, is very promising uh, and is likely to continue in the future. I think the formal methods are going to continue to be used in rare specialized tasks. I'd like to see a little more of that, but I, I don't think that's going to be common, uh, having to be proved wrong in that. But I think we are going to see them in some spe specialized tasks. Now, please work with others to make things better, okay? Because the future is whatever we collectively work to make it. If you are interested in improving open source software, the open source software security, then the answer then is get involved. Okay, and here are just some of the organizations I've mentioned most of them now. Uh, there's of course the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, SigStore, Intoto, uh, there's many others. Um, and there's many others, frankly, I'm not put on this, on this list here. The, the point here is if you want to improve the security of open source software, get involved. And this is not to say that, oh my gosh, open source software security is a disaster, not at all. Um, you know, there's a lot of really secure open source software. Um, open source software has some real potential advantages for security because many people can review it and, and, and get it fixed. Um, but those potentials are not always lived up to. And frankly, we don't want just good. We want really good because we're all dependent on this stuff. So um, we want to make things uh, better and better over time. Which really leads to this uh, bigger point here. Um, developing, deploying secure software, it's really a journey. It's a journey of learning and it's a journey of improving. It's not really a singular event. Uh, because of the way the English language works, it's often easier to use you know, perfections and goals. But the reality is that um, there's always going to be ways to improve security, even if it's not vulnerable. Hey, you know, we can change the software so that it's even less likely to get a vulnerability later. It's going to have stronger defenses. Here, right, uh, are, right below, are just a few links to a few of the things that I mentioned here. I already mentioned the free course. I don't have time to cover a whole course in this very short time, but I'm hoping I'm giving you a flavor of it because in the end, I think that that's in many ways the most important thing is understanding and some education, some training. Um, once you know how to develop secure software, a lot of other things can become easier. And it's one of those things that will pay you dividends through the rest of your software development career. Um, the best practices core infrastructure.org is where the CI best practices badge project um, well lives, or at least you know, that's where you can get started to get a badge. Um, here's a little guide on how to use tools. There's many other guides. Um, you know, the key is get some tools into your process so that it can start into your CI process so that you can start detecting vulnerabilities, um, building on what you already learned from, you know, some course of some kind. All right, so <clears throat> I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. So I'm, uh, I, I, I tried to get through, uh, I know a lot of material relatively quickly. I have lots of backup slides if you want to ask specific questions or go in a particular way, but I'm really interested in helping you today. I want people to leave here feeling that the important questions to them were answered. Um, and I just want to point out that this is of course, part of the LF Live Mentorship Series. Uh, and that's really kind of the goal of all of these um, events uh, for an LF Live mentorship is basically we're trying to give you some information, but we also want to you know, discuss and answer your questions to the best we can 
um, so that you can go away and apply and, you know, and uh, you know, be glad that you were part of the experience. All right, with that, um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to start with looking at some of the questions up that seems to have been built up as we went. Um, so let's see here. Ah, yes. Okay. So the C, the top 25, there's a link there. Sure. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, if you, if you just do in CDB top 25, you should be able to find it quite quickly. Um, yeah. So, and in fact, if you take that, uh, the course that I've been mentioning earlier, which by the way, I make no money. If you go to, if you go to edX and you take the course, I make no money. You pay no money. Um, I am very, very excited about this uh, particular topic. I think it's very, very important. And um, one of the things that I made sure, because I actually uh, wrote that course, um, is that I made sure it covered um, all those top things. So you will actually walk through those various top items and see various options on how to counter, you know, what is it and how do you counter them? All right, how are we going to address the gap to map security from CVE, CPE to SBOM, SWID uh, connection? Okay, uh, so um, so regarding CVE, CPEs, and so on, um, I think that the, okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, there is a well-known method for identifying vulnerabilities, uh, software vulnerabilities. It doesn't it doesn't um, identify them all, but it covers many. It's probably the most most complete collection of any publicly accessible list of vulnerabilities. Um, and it, the idea is pretty straightforward. Every vulnerability has a unique ID. It, they look like CVE dash year. It was reported dash some other number to make it unique. Um, the current problem today with CVEs is although they report vulnerabilities, they don't record. Uh, almost all the vulnerabilities, um, they don't record in their information any way to automatically link the vulnerability report to the software that is vulnerable. Um, there's typically some textual description. Um, and you know what, in a world where maybe you had 100 programs, that's fine. You can live with that. You don't need to worry about automation. Um, I did a, uh, you know, there's literally millions of open source software projects today. That is complete insanity to think you're going to be able to do that by hand today. There are a number of projects which, uh, which are different but share the same name. There are a number of projects which have multiple different names for the same thing. Trying to handle that with a human is ridiculous. Now the CVE does attempt to do this with something called CPEs, but they, but almost no projects have CPEs today. They're not really supporting them. They keep saying they're going to use SWIDs, which don't actually work for this case. I don't know why they keep saying that SWIDs are going to work when it's known they're not going to work because most of the software in there is open source and SWIDs require unique hashes uh, for the ex for the uh, by, for the binaries, oh, by the way, you can recompile. That's a thing. So it, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so what are we doing to address? I think a number of people have repeatedly told the um, CVE folks uh, that this is a critical thing to do. Um, I think the reality is either the CVE process is fixed to, to address that, or that the community will abandon the CVE process and switch to something that actually resolves the problem. I, I'm kind of hoping that the CVE, I mean, it took a lot of effort for the CVE folks to do what they did. I'm hoping that the CVE folks will fix their process so that there can be an automatic connection. But in my mind, there's really no point in reporting vulnerabilities without a way to connect it to the software that's vulnerable. It doesn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make a sense to a lot of other people too. Um, I realize they do it with human readable text that doesn't make, that also doesn't make sense in a world with millions and millions of software projects. So I'm hoping that they'll fix it. If not, I expect the community will come up with an alternative um, that actually resolves the problem. All right. What do you suggest the learning strategy for the beginner? Well, hey, I have an edX, I have pointed that edX course. Start there. Um, 
it's not complicated. You click and learn. It's it's uh, simple little reading materials uh, and uh, and click on quizzes as you go along. It's not it's not fancy. Um, that's a good place to start. There's always something to learn. I've been doing this for a long time, and there's always new things to learn. Um, so you know, start with you know simple courses like that, like that edX course, and then just be open to learning. Okay, just keep you know keep monitoring things. Oh, look, a new kind of vulnerability has been discovered. Let me, I'll read the article about that. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's see here. I think there's a key. Let me go. That was from the chat. Let me go look at the uh, Q and A. I got to find where. There we go. Q and A. All right. Uh, so I'm going to try to answer. Open up from the uh, Q and A sections. Uh, what vetting occurs to prevent bad actors from getting involved in open source security and subverting these proposed improvements in some way? Um, the honest, the answer is actually the same is true for proprietary software. Okay, which is you make sure you, what you should be doing is having other people review that code either before it's employed or afterwards to look at the code to find those problems. Typically, and most the biggest risk is really open source software projects with single developers. In that case, there often isn't a second person who it can review it other than maybe a reviewer, you know, a later potential users who check. One of the advantages of open source is that you can't, anybody, not just the developers, can look. Um, as the projects get larger, typically they start requiring more and more review by other people. Um, and so that makes it much more risky for an attacker to slip in and propose um, uh, subverted uh, uh, improvements. I'll note there actually have been some efforts to insert malicious code that don't that haven't worked. Um, th somebody tried to subvert the uh, insert a malicious code, some malicious code into the Linux kernel um, almost 20 years ago. I think it was like 2003. I may not, the year may not be quite right, but basically they tried to insert code that looked right but it used a single equal instead of a double equal, a very uh, subtle, hard to see flaw if you weren't used to this sort of thing um, that would quietly subvert, you know, enable someone to take over a Linux-based system. It was, that code was never included in a real Linux system, kernel uh, version. It was immediately detected by the kernel developers. Uh, more recently, some, develop, some um, uh, researchers from University of Minnesota tried to create some vulnerable code and tried to insert it, uh, get it added to the Linux kernel. Um, the way they did it, frankly, was not appropriate. I'm not a fan of how they did it. But you know what? Since they did it, I will. Well, we may as well learn from it what they did. And I'll note that once again, their attempts to insert vulnerabilities were immediately rejected. Uh, by the uh, Linux kernel developers. Um, and so therefore, um, you know, oh, oh, I, I, both those are Linux kernel examples. Let me add a third one. Um, this is a very, very different one also. Uh, years ago, Borland sold a uh, proprietary pro database program uh, for years and, it, and, and they had some success in the medical community, but eventually it just wasn't profitable. And so they decided after many, many years of, re of releasing as a proprietary program, they decided to uh, sell as a proprietary program. They released it as an open source software program. Um, within less than a year, um, I mean months, I don't remember exactly how long, um, someone found um, uh, a, a subversion that looked for all the world like a maliciously subverted um, uh, backdoor. Basically, if you entered your the username of politically and the password correct, uh, you were suddenly the database administrator. This was not documented. In fact, it was, of course, a very, very bad idea. Now, maybe this wasn't an, an intentional uh, malicious backdoor. It certainly looks like one, though. And whether or not it was, it shows that, hey, it was sold as proprietary software for many, many, many years. Nobody noticed this backdoor is released as open source software, people noticed, okay? Uh, so while that's no guarantee, that does at least provide decent evidence that people really do look at code, open source software code, and they really do uh, detect and counter problems. All right, next question. What language is the most vulnerable to attacks in developing open source software? 
Oh, that one's actually harder to answer than you might think. Um, let me let me reverse the question a little bit because I think, um, whoops, be, because I think that um, I mean, not this particular questioner may not have had this line of thinking, but I have seen this line of thinking where, hey, if I just chose language X, I will have no more vulnerabilities. And let me just cut that off right away. There is no programming language that ensures that there are no vulnerabilities possible of any kind. Okay, it is always possible to make mistakes in any programming language and that result in what you didn't expect. Okay, now that said, some languages do allow for a kind of uh, foot gunning that is harder to do in any other language. Um, I think probably the poster child for this kind of thing, and I'm sure no one is shocked by this, is the paraprogramming languages C and C++. Um, they're not necessarily awful languages, and they were designed for a particular circumstance and for a particular situation. The problem with C and C++ is that they assume that the programmer never, ever makes a mistake. And the programmer is willing to take great pains and care to check everything. So, hey, before you access an array, you're going to make sure that the uh, array access is within bounds. If you if you ask, if you read from a pointer or write to a pointer, that pointer is going to be where you wanted it to be. OK. Um, <clears throat> It also assumes that the pro, that the software developer is very, very aware and has studied carefully the specification because C and C++ have a huge number of undefined constructs that a lot of people, frankly, are surprised by. You know, they, they a lot of software developers think, in, in, even if they write in C, hey, if I add one to the largest integer, that becomes the most negative integer, right? No. That is undefined behavior. It'll probably result in a vulnerability. It will not necessarily result in wrapping around. Uh, but wait a minute, I thought computers did that. That's a machine thing. You're using C, C has different rules. And um, so I, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier, Chrome, 70% of its vulnerabilities in the last number of years. Microsoft, across its software, 70% of their vulnerabilities are all due to memory safety issues. Um, and C and C++ are memory unsafe always. All use of memory, uh, 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 all use of C and C++ um, always allows memory safety problems. There's no protections against memory safety issues built into the language. Now it's true that some C++ classes, if you use them in certain ways, uh, will protect against some memory safety problems. But in general, but it, it's easy to escape out of. And in fact, it's easy to escape out of them without realizing that you're escaping out of them. So um, those are, are probably the most dangerous in terms of vulnerabilities. But um, <clears throat> many, many other languages, you, know, you can have vulnerabilities in any language. Um, I mentioned earlier a push increasingly towards memory safe languages, languages like Rust and so on. Now, it's not that you can't have memory safety problems in languages like Rust or Ada or many other or C Sharp. Um, but the difference is that you have to specifically enable the un unsafe behavior. So they're safe normally, and then you can disable the safeties in special cases when you need them. But as long as you limit the unsafe code to very small sets you can check carefully, much, much less likely to have at least many classes of vulnerabilities. Okay, um, so that said, can you have vulnerabilities in Java? Yes, absolutely. Can you have many in any other language? Absolutely. Okay, um, so, but, but there's, but there's a trade-off and all too often, it's just too hard today for software developers to be perfect in every way. And that makes it harder to write secure software in C and C++. Not impossible, harder. All right, um, next, uh, let's see here. What static code analysis tools do you recommend? What about dynamic code analysis tools? Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. So first of all, I need to clarify that um, you know, different tools are better for different circumstances, okay? Um, and so it's really not a matter of here's the one tool and off you go, okay? Um, uh, let me, so 
that said, let me let me uh, hit the uh, dynamic analysis tools first. Um, if you're doing a web application scanner, there's a huge number of them, and I'm not. Uh, and it's hard to keep track, but I've used OWASP Zap many times. I've been very happy with it. So there's one. Are there others? You bet. And there's a lot of good ones. Um, if you're using fuzzers, uh, there's tools like AFL++, which is basically the uh, uh, a, a fork and a maintained fork of, of American Fuzzy Lop. Uh, that's something called a coverage guided fuzzer. Uh, coverage guided fuzzers are amazing. They have made it much easier to apply fuzzing uh, without having to be... Um, uh, you know, really, really, uh, you know, basically they, they've lowered the barriers to entry. Um, as far as static code analysis tools, that's way harder. Um, almost every language has at least one linter. Um, use at least one of those. As far as static analysis tools, that's really challenging. And a lot of it depends on the languages that you're using. Um, I know a lot of folks use Coverity, which is a proprietary tool, or Fortify. There's also just a boatload of other tools. Now, one complication that I should also note uh, that makes it a little challenging for me to recommend tools is that some of the proprietary tools come with something called uh, DeWitt clauses in their licenses. Uh, I am very much opposed to these things. Um, DeWitt clauses, are, I think, uh, should be straight up illegal, but basically they say that if you're going to use the software, you, you can't publish results publicly unless we approve. And of course, the tool maker is not going to approve anything that doesn't say the tool is wonderful. And so it's had an incredible chilling effect. Um, I believe that this uh, that these should be just straight up illegal. There's a lot of other free speech laws in the U.S. that prohibit these kinds of things. But somehow this has uh, flown under the radar. Um, and once one supplier adds a do it uh, uh, clause, um, other vendors are typically pressured uh, to add clauses to their tools too, because otherwise, you know, they can, you know, people can talk bad about their tool, but not their competitors. So it, it's a, it's a bad situation and it makes it harder to honestly give you recommendations because what I really need to do is go grab benchmarks that people have done that are published. Um, and it's right now very, very hard to get that kind of data. So I've given you just some personal answers. But in the longer term, um, I'd like to see more and more tools and more evaluations public so that we can make uh, you know, a, a better evaluation um, community-wide. All right, uh, how can you speak to how to best man manage open source software dependency chain today? If I evaluate widget X, how do I manage that uses gadget, gadget A, which uses gizmo B, and so on down to the bottom turtle? I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, indeed. It's turtles all the way down. All right. Um, the, it is something of a challenge. Um, how can I best manage a dependency challenge today? Um, really, I, the, if you are developing software or receiving software, the, the number one thing you can do is, you know, is, is look at the ingredients, what's going in, because you can compare those. There are a number of tools that work to compare um, known vulnerabilities with the software and the version of the software that's actually in there. Um, and you know what? If it's known, to, if, if it's vulnerable, com complain and say, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're depending on an old version, you need to update. And I think right now today, that's uh, one of the key things is going and complaining to your upstream. And you know what? If we weren't talking about software, if we were talking about physical devices with no software at all, that's actually how we would do it also, okay? If I'm building a device made of other devices, which in turn are made of other devices, um, you would look at your, at least at the major components and probably look a little further uh, to see if everything's okay. And if you saw a problem, you would go and complain, you know, uh, to your, what's called the upstream. You think of things in terms of a river flowing down to you. You go to your upstream and say, hey, wait a minute, the thing you're using in there has a problem. Go get that fixed, get it updated or replace it, do something. And really, I think that's what's going to, going to uh, need, what we're going to need is more and more people running tools, detecting problems, reporting back, say, go fix, go fix, go fix, and getting people to start moving and updating. Because today, the problem is often that a vulnerability is found, but somebody uses it, 
uses an old version, doesn't update, and then people who use it end up with this old obsolete subcomponent. So um, it's not um, it's not insolvable. We just need to get people moving. All right, really great presentation. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, what's the best way to do responsible disclosure for open source software with a known vulnerability? Um, all right, uh, let me see. Just a uh, a quick side note, because you asked me a question. Um, I'm actually not a fan of the phrase responsible disclosure. I prefer the phrase coordinated disclosure. Um, the, the folks who originally coined the term responsible disclosure actually recommend using the term uh, coordinated disclosure instead, uh, because it implies that doing anything other than that process is irresponsible. And I don't think that's quite true. Um, Let's see here. So in any case, um, typically for coordinated disclosure, you report to the supplier. Um, and I'm a fan of, of coordinated disclosure with a time limit. In other words, not just reporting, but saying, hey, wait, if you don't report to the world within some reasonable time and fix it, if you don't fix it within a reasonable time, I'm going to tell the world. Now, unfortunately, there's still a lot of, I'm not sure I should call them bad actors, but um, uh, Poor, uh, poorly behaved suppliers who instead will try to threaten me with lawsuits uh, if you expose their problems to uh, the fact that they have a vulnerability to the world. Um, but you know what? Um, too bad. Um, you wrote the software. You included a vulnerability in it. Um, it's your job to fix it. Um, uh, and you know, if, if you won't fix it, then I think the public has a right to know that the uh, software that they were thinking about using is vulnerable and maybe they shouldn't be using it. Um, if you don't like that answer, then please go fix it. Ideally, start writing your software secure in the first place, uh, to be secure in the first place. Um, so what's the best way to do uh, disclosure to open source software? Well, the number one thing to do is actually not your problem, but the open source software project's problem. And that is the open source software project should tell everybody how to report vulnerabilities to it. That is one of the CII best practices criteria. I'll also note that is one of the most commonly missed criteria. In other words, when a project doesn't um, uh, get a passing badge immediately, this is one of the most common reasons for it is they haven't told anybody how to report vulnerabilities to the project. Um, and you know, there are reasons for it, I understand, but you still need to do it. Um, so the best way is to go to the project page, notice that they have told you how to do it, and then go report it, okay? All right, that's a little bit of a cheat. What happens if I go to the project and in fact, they haven't told me how to report a vulnerability? which is unfortunately a common case, actually it's a common case for a lot of open source and closed source software. Uh, so what do you do then? Well, what you do is you go find a way to contact them. Uh, for example, if they're on GitHub, you can at least probably open an issue um, and say, hey, I think I may have found a vulnerability in your software. Please contact me, give some contact info. Uh, and let's talk about this. In most cases, I recommend what's called a coordinated disclosure. In other words, don't reveal publicly immediately exactly what the vulnerability is. And the reason is that attackers will look for that information and will start exploiting customers immediately, people, well, customers, people who are using that software right away. And you know what, that's not fair because the users of that software had no reason to know there was a vulnerability. Um, and it's gonna typically take some time for the supplier of the software to create a proper update and fix it. So, so it's often best to try to do this quietly. Now, when is that not true? Well, sometimes that's not so true. For example, if all the attackers already know about the vulnerability, it may be the only organization that doesn't know about the vulnerability is the project. Um, maybe it's secrecy isn't so important. Maybe the, what's important now is getting it fixed well and quickly. Um, but really, I think right now is find a way, you know, ideally use whatever process they have for reporting. If they don't have one, quietly ask them, create one and coordinate so that you can report the vulnerability to them. Give them a time limit. You can negotiate a time limit. There's various discussions on what a time limit should be. 
Uh, a lot of suppliers think the time limits should be really long. A lot of people who are potentially vulnerable, to, who are possibly impacted by these vulnerabilities, want them very short. But um, you know, a lot of these things can be fixed in a week or two weeks, uh, 45 days on the outset, on um, the outside. Um, you know, some will even give up to 90 days. But you know, basically, you know, try to create a timeline because otherwise, it's easy just to let these things go on and on. And the problem with that is, of course, with that no deadline and just going on and on, eventually attackers are going to start exploiting it. They're, you know, attackers may find it independently. Heck, they may have already found it independently and are already exploiting it. So once a vulnerability is found, it needs to get priority. Well, if it's an important vulnerability, it needs to get priority attention, get fixed. Uh, now, if it's, an, it's, a, if it's a low level of importance, in other words, things like this almost normally never matters, but in this really quirky, weird edge case, uh, edge use that most people wouldn't be doing, it could be exploited, you know, maybe in terms of, you know, it could be shut down, you know, not, you know, not revealing any data, just, you know, maybe it's a denial of service and an incredibly weird edge case. Maybe that's not so important. And maybe you can give more time for that. Um, but uh, for super important vulnerabilities, you want to get uh, then worked all quickly. Okay, so I'm hoping that answers that question. I'll note that the OpenSSF actually has another group, the Vulnerability Disclosures Working Group, where they're uh, discussing things like that. Uh, and there's also other groups like FIRST and so on that have some information about how to report vulnerabilities and vulnerability process, processes in general. Um, okay, let me go to the next question. I have a project with a lot of Dependabot updates have stacked up. Some of the updates are breaking to the existing code. Oh, how do you recommend updating the code? Oh my goodness. Well, I suppose I could just say carefully and leave it at that, but that's not really fair. All right. Um, well, first of all, you have my sympathy because I've lived that, that joy many, many a time. Um, so actually, so let me quickly go on a hobby horse. I, I mentioned this in my presentation earlier. If you are developing software for use by others, you should be ashamed if your API changes in ways where you're making it hard for your users to update. Oh my goodness, I misspelled the old interface. Great, add the new correctly spelled, keep the old one around. Why does it matter to you that it's not? But, but my API has five interfaces instead of four. How about that? Why don't you think about the users for a change? Okay, for the user's point of view, anything that is a breaking change is a big deal because, oh, they just have to rename something or, oh, they just have to restructure some code. Most people have other things to do with their lives than dealing with your API nonsense, okay? So please, please, please try to make it so that software you develop for others isn't just break, isn't breaking, or at least not breaking often, okay? Try to avoid it. Give people lots of time to update. Sure, there are cases where you really just have to do a breaking change, okay? Give them warning, make it as easy as possible to update. Um, I know the Python 3 folks thought, oh, hey, or the Python 2 to 3 is easy. Took them years and years and years and years, and then, and they finally, after a lot of of uh, ignoring the users finally ended up changing Python 3 to make it easier to, to update from two. Um, you don't need to do that. You don't need to abuse your users, okay? Be good to them, not malicious to them. All right, so, uh, but you're not in that, so you're unfortunately in the other circumstance. Some of the updates broke your code. This is a problem. Um, how do you recommend updating the code? Um, I think in general, uh, slowly, incrementally um you know uh, slowly incrementally one at a time if you can um sometimes that doesn't really work because you've got to upgrade things as a unit <clears throat> but in many many cases what you want to do is upgrade very slowly and after every upgrade you run your your carefully uh your, your very thorough automated test suite oh wait you say i don't have a good automated test suite well there's your problem Go get yourself an automated test suite, okay? Um, it's not rocket science. There's lots of test frameworks out, out there. Um, and just, you know, pick a test framework, write a bunch of tests. Um, and, you know, and once you have some, an automated test suite, 
Now, every time you can update, you rerun your test suite. Is it good? Is it not good? You up, run an update. Ah, oh, man, everything broke. Okay, or maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't even compile. All right, well, at least you know what to fix. But you want to try to make each of those changes as small as you can and then use your automated test suites to help make sure that, yeah, it, I mean, it doesn't complain immediately when I update, but does it really work and do what it's supposed to do? Okay, an automated test suite lets you do little tiny increments, update over and over and over again. Uh, package managers also help you because they make it easy for you to say, see that, update it to this version. Do it just one at a time. And typically you don't wanna update, you wanna update incrementally, not just in terms of small number of packages update, but small version increments. If you're using version one, and version 20 is out now, it's likely you might want to version update that version to two to three to four, or maybe one to five to eight to 12, you know, something like that, okay? Instead of just trying to do a big jump one to 20, okay? Um, oftentimes projects will do things like, for example, they'll have backwards compatibility layers and things that warn you, hey, wait a minute, you need to change it to this way. So if you have to change something, if you change more slowly, if you change the version numbers in a more incremental way, you're more likely to get help in improving, changing the software to be ready for the current version. And again, automated test suites. The great thing about an automated test suite is once you have one, those, you, instead of saying, man, I got to change it all at once because I don't want to rerun my tests every time, rerun your tests every time. Doesn't, you know, it's automated, okay? And then you greatly, greatly reduce your risks of problems uh, down the road. Um, and frankly, you know, um, I, I guess this is probably obvious anyway, but I'll just say it. You know, you may need to prioritize. Um, if you've got a lot of updates that have stacked up, um, some are probably more important than others or easier than others. Uh, figure out what you want to prioritize and prioritize those. Okay. Um, all right. So I think that's enough for that. All right. And I'm trying to understand how open source software making money. Can you help me understand? This wasn't really a, a frankly, uh, we could have a whole uh, presentation on just that. Um, in fact, the people have done whole long presentations on just that. So um, I'm not going to be able to answer your question to give it full justice. But let me attempt to do a quick answer. Hopefully, it will at least give you a hand, and then by all means, uh, seek out P um, longer presentations that really focus on that. All right, so um, there's actually a lot of ways that people make money, and a lot of, in a lot of cases, people are doing developing open source software for reasons other than making money in the way that you're thinking about it anyway. So let me start by answering the question as directly asked. Okay, how do people make money as uh, open source software? Well, first of all, uh, a lot of open source software projects sell support uh, or companies sell support to it. So, hey, you can use the software for free. Um, and a lot of companies talk about in terms of funnels. Um, you can't sell services if nobody uses your products. So your first step is how the heck do you get customers in the door? I'm gonna give them the product for free, okay, or a low price and and once they're using the software and are comfortable with it, oh, wait a minute, they want to use it, do it more with it, um, sell support. Some companies, um, they have like the uh, the core is open source, and then there are various ad ad additions that are proprietary, closed source that you can use, but they charge, they charge extra for those. Um, <clears throat> another thing to be fair is that although open source software is often no cost, there's no requirement for that. That's not, a, you'll notice in my definition, that wasn't part of the definition, okay? So people have and continue to sell open source software. Um, now that assumes that you're trying to make money just like typical proprietary or closed source software vendors. But in fact, a lot of folks, this is not the primary reason. Um, for a lot of organizations, um, open, participating in open source software is a money thing, but it's not about making money, it's cost avoidance. You know, if you, uh, hopefully you're familiar with how profit is calculated, right? Income versus out, minus outgo, right? Um, so, you know, revenue minus, minus expenses. Um, so basically, if you, if you can reduce what you spend, you end up with more profit. 
in many, many uh, organizations use and support open source software because it's much cheaper than trying to develop the software themselves. Um, historically, if you look back, um, you know, starting from the uh, late 60s, early 70s, there were a number of, of suppliers who were selling various versions of Unix. Um, and each of them, you know, would, would take some software, modify, try to sell. And the reality was that it turns out to be really, really costly to do that. But if you can take a vast amount of open source software um, and either use it to, and use it directly or use it to sell something else or use it simply to support your infrastructure, it's a lot cheaper than trying to build it all in-house. Even if you have the capabilities, um, there's a... Um, you know, you, you, there's a lost opportunity if you use your resources to do that when, wait a minute, here's some open source software. It's either does what we need or it almost does what we need and we can make some small improvements and make it better and now we can use it for our purposes. Now, once a organization makes an improvement to open source software, they have a decision to make. Should they keep that improvement in house or should they try to release it back? Well, you, would, you might think that, oh, keeping it in-house is the obvious solution, but actually, no. 90% of the costs of software are actually in the sustainment, in the maintenance process, not in the original development. So for most folks, it's a lot cheaper to get that improvement back into the main open source software project because that means then they don't have to keep figuring out how to maintain it. Uh, they don't have to keep trying to figure out how to make that work with other improvements that are being made to that software over time. And so as a pure economic model, it is much cheaper for me, reducing my expenses, okay, to take open source software, improve it, get those improvements back to the project. And now I have something that is far less expensive then and possibly more functional than what I might have done myself. Uh, and so for many, many folks, it's not making money, it's a cost avoidance. And I should honestly note a third, which is there are a lot of people who just like to write software. It's fun. And in a world where everybody seems to think that the only thing that's important in the world is making money, we sometimes forget that, you know what? Humans are humans and humans are awesome. And humans like being creative and doing things like creating software. Um, and we should be grateful to those folks and celebrate these folks because they make some of the most interesting and useful software in the world. So those are three different, and, and we can delve in further, but hopefully that at least gives you an answer to that question. All right, many companies prefer to use or reuse open source software, don't want to share anyway. In this case, how is the open source software, uh, how the, I'm not sure, in this case, how the open source software fundamental is a cheap, I don't, okay, I don't exactly understand that question. So I'll answer what I think you meant and we'll, I'll hope I got it. All right, um, you know what? This is something called the free rider problem. Um, but the great thing uh, from the open source software world is that, you know what, if somebody wants to reuse, take some open source software and use it and contribute nothing back, it also costs the open source software project nothing. And it turns out that a relatively small percentage, it depends on the software, but you know, typically maybe a percent, one percent, maybe two or of, the, of the people who use the software turn around and contribute. That's okay as long as you have a massive number of users. So if you only have 100 users and only 1% are, are, provide any support back, you only got one person who's giving any help. That's a problem. If you have millions of people using that software, this is not a problem. Okay? The, uh, the Linux kernel is available for anybody to use. Not everybody supports back. They literally have thousands of developers and they have an incredible uh, release cadence. Uh, same for Kubernetes. Um, so um, although it can be a problem, as long as you've got a vast number of users, the fact that many users don't contribute back is okay as long as some are willing to work with and contribute back. And uh, large numbers help a lot there. Um, should we take open source software and do changes for our needs without disclosing to the public? Ah, I kind of covered that earlier. Um, you can do that with any code. If, um, believe it or not, you can even do that with GPL code. That is perfectly legal. Whether or not it's wise to do that 
is a different question. If your needs are so weird and peculiar and no one else is ever likely to do anything like that, uh, maybe that's fine. Um, but um, while it's legal to do that, that doesn't make it wise. So let's talk about why you would do that. First of all, if you're an academic, you might say, well, I changed the code, but nobody would want to my, use my ratty code. It's not really intended for production use. Yes, but you still should release it. Why? Because we have a real problem in science, something called the reproducibility crisis. There's an incredible amount of claims that are claimed to be science, but in fact, when people attempt to reproduce the results, we find out that in fact, they're not true. Okay, and that's a big problem in science today, some areas of science much more than others. Um, so if you're an academic and you wanna make a claim and your claim is somehow based on software, you should be releasing that software. Not because you think that the rest of the world is going to just use that as production code, but so that you can answer exactly how you got the results. What was your analysis? Um, modern academic papers just don't have the space to record the details that are necessary. Um, and there have been some serious problems. Um, I, there was actually a problem in 2001 where there's a major algorithmic breakthrough uh, in something called the, sat, uh, the satisfiability problem. Um, but for quite some time, although there was a paper that described this uh, algorithmic breakthrough, no one else could reproduce the results. Finally, the code was made public and in fact, in this particular case, it turns out that the, it was true, but the paper had failed to make some important details clear. And really, it's almost inevitable. You just can't make a paper say everything. By releasing the code, they release it. Now, what happens if it's production code and you're using it in your, in your environment? Well, you can, but if you do that, every time that project makes an update, you're now gonna have to figure out how to merge your improvements with theirs. And they didn't make their changes to work with yours because they don't know what yours are. Very, very quickly, you end up paying an incredible amount of time and effort and money trying to take that code and merge it with the other changes that were made. And the more active that other open source software project is, the harder and more expensive it is. Um, in general, this is a real problem. Whereas if you bring it back, you can avoid that 90%, you know, that, that, that well, that, that huge cost of sustainment. Um, and of course, once companies start doing that, once individuals start doing that, um, the project starts moving faster and that becomes even more important for other people to contribute back to make sure that their improvements get in. Um, so while it's legal, that doesn't make it wise. And you should be trying to make decisions that are wise, not just legal, okay? All righty, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna go back to the, uh, um, uh, to the chat. Uh, let's see here. Um, wow, there are a lot of questions here. <laughs> so let me attempt, I have limited time, but let me try to get to them. Um, David, uh, there is one question, really. I think there are a couple of questions. Uh, the rest of them are uh, thanking you for the presentation. Uh, if I can orient you, there is one question from Ghosh. Um, how, uh, how are we pre prepared? Mm -hmm. Okay, CVE JSON 5.0 schema. Well, I don't know who the we is. Um, I mean, okay. But I mean, C the CV process does a project, you know, the process community, whatever. Um, you know, th there is, of course, uh, JSON 5.0, but we need more than that. We need to do a better job of com of connecting the CVE reports to uh, the software that's vulnerable so that that can be determined completely automatically in almost all cases. Um, so, I mean, yes, there's, there's uh, various improvements to as they update their JSON, but it, in my mind, that's the more important question. Um, so yeah, C assumes the developers can time center Dennis Ritchie. Well, and, and to be fair, the problems that they had at the time were quite different. Um, you know, they were trying to make very limited equipment do a whole lot. Um, I, you know, 
you know, modern phones are thousands of times faster, thousands, probably millions of times faster, you know, thousands of times faster, thousands of times more memory than the equipment that they were working with initially. So, um, you know, different circumstances, uh, different problems. Um, let's see here. Yes, the slides will become available. Um, Okay, no matter the language, we do see plenty more vulnerabilities in the application stack, or the lower stack, all the system stack might have blast radius. Um, I think that's kind of oversimplifying, but there's some truth to it. I think the re, I would characterize it slightly differently, although maybe it's a subtle distinction. Um, the system tier, because that's used by so many different completely different applications, um, gets a lot of focus from a lot of different folks. And so um, uh, a number of vulnerabilities get squished out from a number of the system tier components simply because there's more people using them than any one specific application stack. Um, and of course, a lot of the application stack stuff moves uh, is uh, faster moving and changing. And when you make a lot of changes in a hurry, you're more likely to make mistakes. I mean, that's true for software, it's just for anything else. Uh, but I think the reality is that we need to worry about security at all layers, okay? And there are basic fundamental principles that apply no matter what. You need to know, I mean, it's true that, for example, I mentioned memory safety. For many, many languages, you know, your solution is use a language that provides memory safety, you're done. Uh, for some folks, though, you usually use a memory a language that's usually memory safe, but you can disable them, limit when you disable them. And when you do, now you got to apply that knowledge that's specific to memory safety issues, because in the unsafe parts, it's um, you have to apply that. Of course, if you're programming in C and C++, uh, there is no safety. It's always unsafe. And therefore, um, you have to write with extra care to make sure you don't have any of those problems. But you know, a vast amount of the stuff is just true across the board and you learn it. All right, uh, okay, humans are awesome. Okay, well, you know, yeah, yeah. FSF can, you know, you know what, uh, the, the people who write the code, all the rest of depend on, you know, like any other infrastructure, I am always, I am grateful to those many unsung heroes who make our roads, uh, you know, build the build our buildings, and oh yes, write the software that we all depend on. So I'm grateful to all of them, including many, many of you who developed the software that the rest of us depend on. But please, please, um, there's some. Um, I, I've tried to kind of give that surface. Take a course. I pointed to a free one. Um, you know, uh, learn a little bit of you know, you know, if you're doing, if you're managing or involved in open source projects, uh, try to get badges. Uh, get some uh, tools into your CI pipeline. Um, while it doesn't guarantee, those things don't guarantee everything, they really make a tremendous difference. All right. Um, wow, I'm out of, am I out of questions? I can't believe that. Surely people have some more questions for me. Because I do want to answer questions is kind of the point of this. <laughs> Yeah, you probably have time for maybe one or two more more questions. One or two more questions. All right. So uh, somebody quickly uh, type in a question. So we will, uh, I, I can't believe I managed to get through them all. We, there were some uh, interesting, there were a number of interesting questions here. Um, okay. Um, I had, a, a, when I was creating this presentation, I had originally thought about uh, diving in, for example, into the many different uh, common kinds of vulnerabilities, um, you know, I mentioned right here. Um, but um, I decided not to. Um, there is always a danger, first of all, that thinking that if you know the most common kinds, you know all there is to know about security, and that's not true. Um, but uh, in 45 minutes, I just wouldn't have had time to get in enough. Um, it's not that I need a lot of time, it's just 45 minutes isn't quite enough. Um, and so, you know, what I really want you to do and say is point you to these top lists, point you to a courses like the one I just mentioned that kind of walk through who are the top ones, how do you counter them, but, you know, counter them in terms of things like, you know, write code this way instead of that way, or use this kind of approach instead of that kind of approach. Um, none of them are terribly complex mentally, 
uh, particularly if you're just worried on what am I trying to avoid and how do I fix it? I mean, you don't need to know the details of memory management to know how to avoid buffer overflows. You know, don't try to read and write out of the uh, buffers, to usually arrays that, that you're supposed to be using. Check, make sure that you're within them. It's not complicated at least mentally, it can be complicated to do because you have to keep doing it over and over again. But if you're using C or C++ or any other unsafe construct, that's your pay. That's what you're paying for. You know, you are getting all the control, but now you have to take responsibility for the um, awesome level of control you receive. If that's not, if you're not comfortable with that, if that's not what you wanted, maybe these, these were not the right design decisions for what you have planned. Um, if, I, if you use C, uh, what tools or guidelines exist to assist uh, GBD, et cetera? Well, in fact, I've already gone through a number of those. There are a number of guidelines for, um, I, I talked through the course, there's a cumber, um, it lists a number of common vulnerabilities. Um, when, you, when I talk in the course itself, it mentions specific things. So, you know, don't, for C, don't use stir copy if you don't have to. Uh, using stir and copy or s and printf or um, some other function like that, which provides automated protection, is going to you know, basically replace the dangerous ones with the less dangerous ones. Uh, and the course goes through the video. You know, instead of this function, do this, or the, you know, consider using this instead. Um, GDB is not really gonna be so much of your friend here. Um, GDB can help you find if you have a particular input that you know is a problem, but the challenge is finding the inputs. Uh, fuzzers can sometimes help you find inputs that will cause trouble. Uh, in which case, once if you use a fuzzer and it finds a vulnerability, then yeah, you could use GDB to uh, help you find those. But um, it's much better to know ahead of time what are the common problems, you know, what kinds of function calls or approaches should I use instead, and then using tools to detect problems um, and fixing those remaining problems is really the, uh, the way to go if you're using, if you're using C. Um, and I use C a lot myself, so it's not like you can't write secure software in C. You just gotta be stinking careful. If you're writing in C, also go read the standards. If you have not read the standard, in particular the appendix on, what, on undefined uh, behavior, you gotta do it. There's a lot of things that are undefined that a lot of people who write in C have no idea, and they're just basically foot guns waiting for you. So hopefully also, that answers that question. David, GCC seemed to be including some of the um, CW detection lately with their F analyzer option um, that I'm finding useful to run through. Right. I'm uh, code. right. Now, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a, a GCC and CLang also has some tool, you know, using GCC and CLang to detect some vulnerabilities. It's a tool. It's just mm -hmm. like your other tools. Turn right. on as many as you can. By all means, turn on the mechanisms in GCC to detect vulnerabilities. Um, on the other hand, don't expect that GCC or CLang or any other tool will find all the vulnerabilities. You want to learn how to avoid them in the first right. place, and then you want to use tools to help you find the ones that got through. Right, absolutely. Thank you. Very good, very good. Well, I'm done. Yes, you did it. <laughs> we are right at time, everyone. Um, big thank you to David and to Shua for their time today. And thank you all for participating and asking questions. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. Uh, we hope you all join us for some future mentorship sessions, and that's a wrap. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone.